This episode of The Unstarving Musician is powered by Liner Notes. If you would like to learn from the hundreds of musicians and industry professionals I've spoken with for The Unstarving Musician on topics such as marketing, the songwriting process, touring, sync licensing, and more, sign up for Liner Notes. It's an email newsletter from yours truly in which I share some of the best knowledge gems I've garnered from the many conversations I've had for The Unstarving Musician podcast. You'll also find out about upcoming podcast episodes as well as occasional liner notes subscriber exclusives. Sign up at unstarvingmusician.com. It's free and you can unsubscribe at any time. This is The Unstarving Musician. I'm Rabonzo. This is my podcast on which I feature conversations with independent music artists and industry professionals. An occasional relevant special topic episode with yours truly, alone. It's all intended to help indie music artists better understand the marketing, business, and creative processes that power us to do more of what we love, make music. That was pretty close. Hey, by the way, this podcast could use your support. You can support The Unstarving Musician in many ways, including by following us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also just tell a friend about the podcast. That would be fantastic. Or you can visit unstarvingmusician.com forward slash crowd sponsor or the show notes for this episode to learn about the many other ways of offering your support. Welcome to another episode, by the way. It is great to be in your earbuds, on your speakers, your Sonos, in your car, wherever you're listening. Did you have a good Thanksgiving holiday? I did. I had some family here. Are you ready for the Christmas, for the Christmas season? What about the new year? It is coming. They're all coming. It's amazing. It's going too fast, isn't it? Always does. Christine McVie of Fleetwood Mac sadly passed this week. Yesterday, as I record, Thursday, December 1st of 2022. She leaves behind an incredible body of work, legions of fans, and of course, friends and family. She will be missed. The plan, by the way, for the podcast is to have two more episodes this year, and then after a little time off, it will resume on January 13th, 2023. That is the plan anyway. So I hope you'll be here with me for all of that. My guest for this episode is Fia Nix. She's considered stylistically as somewhere between Whitney Houston, Mariah Carey, and Tony Braxton. She embraces a theatrical approach to her music and experimental clashing of genres. Fia is also seen as a Hollywood glam star garnished with a rock star twist. On her latest release, Red Umbrella, she unleashes a masterful vision for storytelling, and the album attempts to connect the dots along the path less traveled, embracing strength through vulnerability, divine femininity, spiritual awakening, sexual liberation, and of course, a love story. Fia recorded her first album, Everything Girl, at Fame Studios in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, under the musical direction of Will McFarlane, known for working with Etta James, Bonnie Raitt, Bobby Blue Bland, among others, and Brian Maloff also worked with her on that album. Maloff is known for work with Michael Jackson, Queen, and Madonna, among others. And the album features players from the iconic Muscle Shoals rhythm section, The Swampers. She has toured the U.S. and Asia and has been featured on the back cover of Billboard Magazine, Rolling Stone, Celeb Mix, Music Connection, Illicit Magazine, Prelude Press, Buzz Music, The Hype Magazine, among other publications. And that is the abbreviated version of her bio from phoenix.com. Earlier this year, she did an impressive video for the single Escape with dancer-choreographer Bobby Newberry, known for work with Danity Kane, Pussycat Dolls, and Missy Elliott. I love the video, and we talk about that in this conversation. Plus, we talk about PR, marketing, common indie artist struggles, release strategy, recording studio lessons, building confidence through repetition, and theatrical performance. I believe that Fia was suffering from allergies or possibly a cold when we spoke. 
Sophia. Not Sophia. So, Fia. <laughs> I hope you're you're all better now. Please enjoy this conversation with me and singer, songwriter, performer, Fia Nix. Hey there, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Where are you today? Um, I am actually on the East Coast today. I am in Maryland. Okay. And do you live in California? I forget. I yeah. So I'm in Los Angeles. Um, but I've also been spending half my time over here. So by coastal at this point. So we're recording this for those listening November 10, 2022. And you have an upcoming release in just eight days, Lost Without You, right? Yes, that's the next big release. And I saw you recently worked on a video for it. Was that fun? Yeah. Oh, it was a blast. We just shot that. I've been working with an incredible company, uh, Vincent House Productions. They're based mm -hmm. out of Los Angeles. And we I don't often do a lot of cover songs, but every once in a while, there's a song that I just have loved forever yeah. and love to find a way to take, you know, the original magic, whatever made that song so great and put my own spin on it. And so this is a song that um, I've wanted to cover forever. And I thought it would be a fun, like, you know, pre right before the holiday release. It's Robin Thicke's Lost Without You. OK, um, but it's a very different version. It's kind of slowed down. That song's already slow but it's slowed down even more. Um, it has a little bit more of like a jazz kind of R&B thing going on. But yeah, the video just elevated it to another level. So I'm very excited for that to come out. That's cool. Is the production going to more resemble your latest collection of songs release? I'm, I don't have the name of the release in front of me, but is it going to, I know I'm gonna, we're going to get to it in a minute because I wanted to talk about it, but is it going to more resemble that or is it going to go back a little bit to your prior like 2018 release sound? Yeah, you know what? Actually it is. It's kind of a, throwback to my 2018 sound um my sound has changed a lot over the years but that first album I put out was very like jazz R&B it was more soul it had this kind of old Hollywood thing going on uh, like aesthetically speaking that's kind of what my fan base was originally based on that's what people kind of grew to know and love me for um and since then I've kind of branched out from that but it's still a big part of who I am as an artist and as a person. So this is kind of like an homage to, you know, day one Phoenix, because that is such a big part of who I am. That's probably also why I haven't actually done this song, because I feel like it was something I should have done so long ago. It was also something I probably couldn't have done justice back then. So I do think, you know, everything is in the right time. But yes, this is very much kind of an old, original type of Fia sound. Everything else, what you're referring to, is going to kind of kick off an entirely new sound that I'm going into. So I kind of wanted to get this one out there before we, you know, turn that page. Yeah, yeah. And then also on the 9th, you're doing a couple of Christmas tunes, yeah? I am. I've forever wanted to do some Christmas music. I haven't actually ever done any original Christmas music. So this year I was actually commissioned um, through Billboard and they wanted me to do a couple originals. So that's exciting. Um, those are coming out December 9th. And yeah, it's two original Christmas songs. It's a little bit of both sides of the spectrum. You have your very classic, cheesy, kind of Mariah Carey-esque Christmas classic song. And then you have a more modern take, more of like an Ariana Grande kind of edgy, more like eclectic type of Christmas song. So both sides of the spectrum there. Well, I love Christmas songs. Me too. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hearing They're it. They're already on my radio, like November <laughs> 1. I'm ready to go. You beat me. Um, Yeah, I, I have, I think I have kind of a really sort of old school taste, like really old school taste in holiday music. Uh, but, yeah. but there are some, you know, these songs are covered constantly, but, but there are some, um, some artists that'll cover things that I, I, I often like and and I also like I haven't really met anybody that does but I love these uh blues Christmas albums by some oh, of the I older love, artists. <laughs> I that's see that's right up my alley like if I had it my way that's what I would do too. But yeah, that's why I wanted to make kind of something for everyone. I tend to mm -hmm. lean like you towards that classic Christmas jolly, you know, happy go lucky type of thing. But you know, it's also like Right now, I'm still trying to get my name on the map. So this is a great opportunity for me to release something that the other half is going to love as well. That kind of like Christmas vibe, but in like a more modern way. So we got one of each. That's exciting. Well, I hope you'll keep me on the 
notification list for for all three of those things you have coming out. <laughs> Absolutely. Look forward to hearing them. Speaking of getting your name out there, I you know I'm fond of the opinion that it's really hard these days. Do you do you feel that way as well? I know you've got you you have a lot going for you in that department and, or in that you created a music PR company and you you have what appears to be a pretty rich performance or a pretty good resume for performance. So I'm sure all that helped a lot, but do you find it hard today as well? Oh, absolutely. I think it's the biggest struggle as an independent artist, which is partly why I created my PR company. It was based off of the need of, you know, you put your blood, sweat and tears and you dedicate your entire life to making this music, which of course we all love. So it's worth it. But you get to a point where it's like, all right, well, I'd love it if people actually heard this, you know, or if I could actually, you know, be in enough people's ears and <clears throat> able to actually book myself and tour and make a living out of this and really turn this into a career. I just, I think over the course of being an artist and trying to figure that out, how do you put yourself on the map? I just overturned every stone. Like, what can I do to help myself have a better chance? And yeah. so going into the PR company, I never set out to create a company. Um, it was more me trying to say, what can I do to be more self-sufficient, to do some, take some of this on? Because it's also very expensive to be an artist. You have to do the PR. You need the marketing. You need some sort of booking agent or some sort of manager or label. And all of it does have financial ties. So um, the more that you can do, the better. And then you kind of source the rest. And I've been lucky because over the course of like the 10 years that I've been doing this, you know, I've done what I can do to help, but I've also met people along the way and have been able to kind of create this empire where everyone is contributing, everyone's bringing a certain skill set. Mm -hmm. And it's just we're elevating each other. But, you know, I, over the course of the pandemic, actually, um, basically went to school for PR only with the hopes of being able to promote my most recent album. Yeah. And it was such a 360, the results that I got from that, from like my first album I put out to this most recent one, it was so exponentially more successful that, you know, all my friends who are musicians and artists were like, whoa, what's going on? What'd you do? How are you doing this? So then I started just kind of giving them pointers, helping them out. And eventually it just kind of snowballed and it became this company whose results speak for themselves. And it's just a great way for me to help myself and the most talented people I know, my inner circle, to actually have a chance to be heard and to, to get that exposure. Do you, among your circle or maybe some people you've observed on the periphery, do you find anything that independent artists will anything in particular that they'll struggle with or get stuck on when they're trying to get themselves known as we just talked about you you've been doing yeah I think honestly it's just kind of a lack of knowing what to do um, most of my clients that come to me I immediately think like why aren't you farther along than you are because you're so talented like you're saying you have this great resume you've performed you've opened for the game and you've like some of my clients have done some incredible things they have these great resumes this impeccable music quality's top notch and they have 80 monthly listeners and you know that to me shows that there's just a disconnect of not really knowing where to go what to focus on where to put my money where to put my energy what should I be doing so it's kind of kind of what I do is kind of branching beyond PR but it's when someone comes to me or be it myself it really is you kind of have to make sure that your ground zero is taken care of. The package has to be right. The branding has to be right. Um, everything has to be there and in a pretty package that's very marketable, that's very easy to pitch so that people come along. You know, they're only going to give you X amount of time, one or two lookovers, and they're going to decide if they want to do anything with you or not. So you just have to make sure that the groundwork is laid so that when these people come, when that opportunity arises, you're ready. So basically, it's just I think knowledge, knowing what to do, how does my package need to look? Where should I be focusing my energy? And so 
that's kind of what I've been working on as an artist and what I've also been helping my other clients work on just based off of the res- the results that I've gotten from just some slight changes I've made um, and some things I've chosen to focus my attention on. Yeah, and you clearly have a, a unique twist to your offering in that you're doing what they want to do and, and doing it at a high level. So that must feel, instill a lot of confidence in your clients. So switching gears, yeah, uh, I watched your escape video maybe a couple of times, but I was watching it again today and I just wanted to come and I call it your video. You had a collaborator and it's <laughs> yeah. funny because I actually found it on his channel. Maybe you can tell us about him too, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it, so it came out in May uh, of this year. It looks and sounds really good. And I've watched a lot of, I mean, I don't make my week of it, but I've watched several indie videos and some of them by, you know, people that really know what they're doing but I yeah I was just watching it and it struck me that wow this looks really really good and the dancing's amazing in it obviously but it's not just that I don't know what it is the visual's good maybe the coloration the sound's good and it may just be you guys went out of your way to make make it you know two percent better here two percent better there until you came up with the with the final look but how how fun or what was it like or you know tell me a little bit about it That was a really fun project because um, that was the first time I collaborated with Bobby Newberry. It actually, ironically, was technically his project that I was featured on, but it became very much kind of like an equal collaboration because we both just got really excited about it. We work with a producer, uh, Sam J. Garfield, and we had been through Sam continually saying like, I'd love to work with Bobby. I'd love to work with Fia. We both had kind of been like, hey, lay that groundwork. And ironically, it's great that you say the dancing's so good. And that makes sense because Bobby Newberry is very, very well known in the dance industry. Mm. So he's like a very well known choreographer and dancer. He stands for like, and choreographed for like the Pussycat Dolls. Like he has credentials for days. And ironically, so I actually started as a dancer when I was much younger, first Mm. moved to LA to be a dancer. And back then, I used to like absolutely idolize Bobby as, you know, this big choreographer. Like I had taken his convention one or two times. Like I very much looked up to him in the dance world. So it's funny that fast forward, you know, we would become friends and then admire each other as musicians and want to collaborate on music, an entirely different, you know, form of art. So we were good friends now. Um, We did finally make that connection, get in the studio, Sam, put out this incredible track and we both thought like this is hot this is dance this is disco this is a great like disco e throwback sound but very modernized and we immediately thought we can do a really cool video with this and to your point too as I was saying just over the years my team has expanded I'm close friends with people who have that really high quality production and or have access to it Um, as well as same with Bobby. Like we both were able to pull on our resources and put out this video that I actually think is probably one of the highest quality things I put out today. It does, it really has that cinematic feel. The quality is high. The content itself is good. And I personally think the song kicks ass. So I, yeah, thank you for saying that um it was a super super fun project and one that we're really proud of and has done really well over the summer and is continuing to do well so yeah that was a good one (laughs) it's cool and did you infer that you know each other from the mutual producer that you have or how did you guys meet yeah so well so I like I said I always knew of Bobby kind of idolized him and then yes through uh Sam J Garfield he's actually my best friend and my exclusive producer, I work only with Sam. And we were actually at his birthday party one year and Bobby ended up coming through. And then Bobby and I were able to actually talk and did become friends at that point. And then musically started collaborating probably a month or two after that. Tell me about your release strategy or the the music release journey you've been on. And, um, my, and to give you my perspective, which is probably not the whole picture but so i see a couple uh two album or ep releases i'm not i realized i don't even know what constitutes album versus ep once you get past about five songs but um <laughs> right. in, including the 2018 release uh, obviously of every everything girl which i really yeah. dig 
and then oh, thank you. and and then this year's red umbrella it, it, yeah. um a big departure in in the sound but of the first one but what what is the release intent been and what's the whole journey been like and was there something was there much more before that too with leading up to it Ah, uh, it's such a long story, but a good one. So I, I like I said, I started out as a dancer, um, but then when I moved to LA, at like twenty years old, I actually ended up auditioning for this girl group um, through Interscope Records, and became the third member. Long story short, became the third member of this girl group. Um, we did a little bit of a national tour. It was very much of an EDM sound. Um, it was also very dance based where we would like mostly dancers that could also sing, but then long story short, <laughs> a bunch of things happened as they do in the music industry and the band fell apart. We were dropped from our record deal, but that's what had lit a fire in me to say, okay, this dancing has been fun, but I'm kind of tired of being a backup dancer. I want to go into music. And I always grew up singing. I grew up singing in church and in choir and just, you know, singing on my own. And that was something that I loved, but I didn't, you know, really ever think about pursuing until that moment. And so after that group diminished, I kind of took matters into my own hands um, and just started writing and started like seeing like, if I was going to be an artist, what kind of music would I want to make? Fast forward, ended up signing on with a producer who worked with Sony and had a distribution deal through them. And that's where the album Everything Girl was birthed. Like we were saying earlier, I love the soul and the jazz and the Motown era. And so Everything Girl was actually recorded at Muscle Shoals or in Muscle Shoals, Alabama at Fame mm -hmm. Studios. Saw that. And yeah, and we actually had the original Swampers um, there in the studio with us. They're on all the tracks. They charted everything, and which is amazing too. I always tell everyone the story, but their charts are like, unreadable by anyone but themselves like they had their <laughs> own like lingo I don't know it's it's like chicken scratch to me but it's so cool so I actually want to frame those someday and hang them up up in my studio but yeah they were just so down to earth so amazing it was so much fun it was my first time ever recording professionally in a studio ever besides mm -hmm. that girl group experience and so it was very intimidating but also one of the best experiences I've ever had because you know and here's these guys who have just done legendary things these men like are responsible for some of the biggest tracks still today from some of the biggest name superstars that ever were and here they are in the studio with me you know so green at the time making this incredible music and so that very much brought out that r&b motown soul vibe that i have that i love but it was also very much as much as I resonate with that album, it was very much, um, I was very much led and which is great because I needed it, but I wasn't giving a lot of input as far as maybe what I would have done differently. I also didn't really have the confidence at the time as an artist to really stand up and say, maybe I would hear this a little more this way. Maybe I want something a little more that way. So I was very much guided, like I said, which was necessary at the time, but it's it, it 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 tapped on elements of me as an artist, but not entirely. So when Red Umbrella came around, you know, this is several years later, I was taking what I had and expanding upon it, expanding my repertoire, writing new things, trying new things. And it was actually during the pandemic, the lockdown era, <laughs> that I was sitting in my room, kind of just writing and like using it as like a way to kind of cope with what was going on. And you know, things just, it was the first time ever too, that I didn't have anyone telling me like what to do, what to write, you know, that distribution deal had ended. So I was on my own. So I was just experimenting. I was just trying new sounds, letting new things come to me. Like some of it was awful. Some of it was really good. And so it was just in that fun trial and error, no pressure time frame that I started realizing, like I have other parts of me as an artist that are trying to come out. And so Red Umbrella was very much eclectic. And I like to say that it tells a story from the first to the last track of my journey and my growth through that that next year. So it's very much a mixture of, you know, the pop, the classic pop formula with some of that R&B Motown from before, but then like, you know, little bits of jazz. There's a Latin song on there. Um, there's some like rock forward songs, which is 
actually more of the direction I'm leaning in now. But yeah, it was nice. just very eclectic and pulled from a lot of different influences and resources. And that album resonates with me in a whole nother way as an artist. And I think it's just representative of my evolution as a human being and in music. Sure. Going back to the the earlier uh, studio experience, did, were there things that the folks there at the studio offered to you in any moments that you might have had where you were unsure of yourself or maybe you weren't as practiced as you needed to be and it's all new? Do you remember anything sort of standing out? Um, I mean, this is funny. It's not like it's more embarrassing and it probably they probably would never even remember this. But I was in like, you know, the little sound booth and it was like very dark in there. And there was like a light bulb that was hanging down. And I tend to get kind of dramatic and passionate when I sing. And so I'm like in there already feeling like you're saying a little bit self-conscious, a little bit nervous, like finally just kind of settling in though and getting in the groove. And as I'm like, you know, hitting these high notes, doing this thing, I accidentally slap the light bulb <laughs> and it shatters. Of course the light goes out, it shatters and you know, everything's mic. So it makes this God awful noise. And it was just like absolutely mortifying, embarrassing, humiliating. I I was like, oh my gosh. Of course, they were so nice. They run in. Oh my gosh, are you okay? I had like cut my hand. It was so embarrassing. So like when you ask that question, <laughs> sadly enough, that's like the first thing that comes to mind is that like embarrassing moment. But no, they were so great with me. And I have a lot of behind the scenes footage that I, I still, I don't know why I never released and I should, but it just reminds me at the time I was so down on myself and just felt so out of my element. But watching back now, just being very honest with myself, I was good. I was good and I should have been more confident and they were impressed with me. And so if there's any sort of takeaway from that as an independent artist, like you belong there. If you're in that room, you belong there. So act like it. And I wish I would have done that. It's hard though, right? When it's a new thing. Uh, and totally. I'm really happy you shared that. I asked because I just recently had a couple of guys over, both friends, just doing some demos here in my home studio. And it struck me that they were, especially one of them in particular, but both of them were like apologetic about, you know, the, the performance that they were giving me, wow. and the, you know, this lack of preparedness and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I was just like, man, don't be so hard on yourself because right. we don't do this every week, right? It's a, and we've all done it before in different amounts of frequency. But uh, so then I was just, I had written about it to my subscriber, my newsletter subscribers, because I figured, you know, people run into that and you have these moments where you're like, you know, you're really down on yourself. Right. And there's just something funny about putting something on, you know, tape uh, uh, t recording too. you. You realize whether you were prepared or not. It's like, oh, I want this <laughs> right. to be better. And this person spending time <laughs> right. with me to do this. So, yeah, totally. I mean, I, I relate to that. I'm actually an over preparer because I'm so anxious about what you just said. Like the thought of getting in the studio and be having that moment of like that realization of, wow, I'm really ill prepared is like uh, the biggest fear for me. So I'm someone that will like, prepare to the point where it's like annoying like, <laughs> like I get in there and then I can't like relearn it because I, I know it so well but <laughs> I know exactly what you mean and I I think to go back to your previous question too like things that I notice about the artists that I see and work with and myself in general I think that's another big one besides the you know the lack of knowledge is also just the the lack of the, the lack of confidence that like self-assured that like, and not even just confident of like, oh, I'm just the best around. It's more like confident in the fact of, I don't have to be perfect all the time. I'm still a human being. Music is subjective. These are ideas. It's okay to just throw them out. And I think that's something that's so taboo, right? It's like every note, if we're a professional singer, a professional songwriter, every note that comes out of my mouth, every lyric I write needs to be gold and that's just so sad because that's where things get capped off the magic is stifled and I think that's a big difference from my first album to my second album my first album I was very worried about that my second album I said I don't really care and maybe it's because it was just me in my room alone you know you can only be so embarrassed in front of yourself and then you get over it but that's what kind of unleashed these other things these great things that came out you know amongst the the chaos and the weirdness there was some gold in there and I wouldn't have found that if I had been afraid to 
feel uncomfortable. Yeah. One of the gifts of the pandem pandemic. And uh, that sounds funny yes. to say, but <laughs> right. gives, you, gives you, gave us a little time to do those kind of things. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's also nothing like experience and repetition to give you eventually give you that confidence too and uh yeah. and and sort of the knowledge of how much you really do need to prepare to just reach a level of comfort and you're never going to be perfect you're going to get really close to it sometimes but most of the time you're not going to be right <laughs> exactly and honestly though that's when I like it the best like my favorite songs of people are like the ones where it's not overly auto-tuned to where there's no vocal distortion like it's almost vocally distorted like I like to hear the little what we call mess ups or like flaws I think that's what makes music good that's what gives it True. like that soul back yeah totally what are your biggest inspirations for the whole theatrical approach that you have you know that lives in your music and you're performing I'm sure what where does that come from oh uh, that's a great question um I would say I mean, I don't know what that is. I think that honestly just stems from within. I think it's like the dancer in me. It's that like kind of born, natural born performer that's just wanting to come out. I, I don't know why I've always had this love of like playing a character. So when I'm on stage, it's like these characters come out, but they're also just parts of who I actually am. It's not like I'm acting, I'm pretending to be someone else. It's just different assets of me in this grand kind of over exaggerated form um and it's great because when you're on stage everyone kind of just has to watch you has to put up with you and you can kind of do whatever you want right but i think like if you look at some of my favorite all-time artists like i love prince is there a better performer and he's very theatrical i love stevie wonder that's another person like you could watch forever like he has his own way of perform like he's just captivating i just I think also both of those people, they just get lost in the music. I don't think they go out there with the intention of like, I'm going to do this move and that. Like, it's just something, something unleashes in them and they just do their thing. And I feel like that's what happens to me on stage. I just, I guess I'm just theatrical because I'm just dramatic and bold by nature. And my personality is big and that's where it feels like it's able to flourish you strike me then just from what you said and thinking about it, you were probably a bit of a ham as a child, right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I actually, um, on one of my tours a couple of years back, um, one of the visuals we had was actually this awesome montage of me as a child versus me now, like live footage of me touring through the world. And it was so hilarious. The reason we made it was because they were very much the same in two different settings. Like I was doing the same moves, the same twirls and jumps to the ground and all this when I was three in the living room with this pretend microphone, as I do now on stage when I'm, when I was doing my tour through Asia, like the footage was the exact same, just in two entirely different settings. And so we made this montage of me as a kid and me as an adult, and we would put the clips next to each other to see like the <laughs> comparisons. And it was adorable, but also just so funny. It's like, I, some part of me never grew up. I'm just fulfilling that childlike need, you know, me in the living room at three years old saying, mom, watch me, watch me, watch me. That's the same me up on stage saying, watch me, watch me, <laughs> hopefully less annoying, but <laughs> yeah. That's a surprise too, because when, for someone like me, who's new to what you do as a performer and, and a songwriter and singer, dancer, uh, it, it, it all looks very serious. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a kid in there right that's great. totally at least for me I mean there's definitely moments like I like even my live shows they're very much an emotional roller coaster like we definitely do have the moments where it is more serious for me I'm just I'm just having a good time up there it, you can tell <laughs> Bia thank you so much for spending time with me today it's been really fun getting uh to know you I could talk for another hour and I'm looking forward to your releases. Please do keep me apprised of, of how they're going. It was really a fun conversation today. Yes, thank you so much. I really appreciate being on the show. Also, just I really appreciate what you do with this podcast because it is very hard 
to be an independent artist or any artist in this industry. And that's how I found you is that your podcast is so helpful. And there's so many brilliant minds that you feature on here from all aspects of it. And it's been very helpful for me and my career. And now hopefully I can give back a little bit with what I know and we can continue to elevate each other. Thank you. That means the world to me. And I know it's going to mean a lot to listeners of the podcast to hear what you had to say. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much. You have been listening to the unstarvingmusician.com with Robonzo. That's me. Thank you. Please follow us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you really loved this episode, please tell a friend about the podcast. You can find links and mentions for this episode at unstarvingmusician.com. Peace, gratitude, and a whole lot of love. But wait, there's a little bit of bonus content with Via Nix coming at you right now. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. One of the options for you is you can ask me anything that you want. An, oh, an cool. A, okay. an AMA, if you will. And then the other one, which you may choose as an option or both, is to tell me something about yourself that few people know about you. Okay, I'll do both. I'll ask you a question and then I'll tell you something you don't know. Okay. Or something that people don't know. Go for it. All right. Well, I would love to know what actually inspired you to start this podcast and what is your ties? Like, what is your passion behind this, you know, unstarving musician? Well, the sort of funny answer is a mentor told me I needed to start a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but <clears throat> it really started with a book that I wanted, decided I should write for musicians like a number of my friends who seem to have trouble getting uh, gigs, you know, performing places. And I was at a time in my, not the second time in my life, once in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and then a second time, like a second life in the San Francisco Bay Area, where as a drummer and a singer, I could get gigs whenever I wanted with almost whoever, whoever I wanted. And That's getting, great. Yeah, and getting paid. And a lot of it involved, you know, subbing and bands and having a couple of bands and this kind of thing. So it was sort of just to share the story in hopes that I could help people. And then, you know, the mentor came into the picture and I started thinking, yeah, this is a cool idea. I can, you know, I had this grand vision of helping other musicians. And then I realized that as soon as I started, I like maybe interview three or four, I'm talking to songwriters which I wasn't at the time. And I've only written a couple of songs in my life, actually. But wow. uh, I start talking to all these independent musicians and songwriters. And so it's a whole new world because like, I'm just a guy who's mostly played in cover bands. I've had a couple of original <laughs> projects, you know. So right. that, that's where it started. And every once in a while, someone comes out of the otherwise vacuum that I live in when I do this and says, you know, something like kind of like what you were saying that I, I really, you know, appreciate what you're doing. You, I've learned you know, a lot of different things from different people. And I'm every once in a while, you know, these ones were like, I've been binging on your podcast on the yeah. commute to work or something. You exactly. Know, so, yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of what I was saying earlier. It's like you set out, you know, with a certain intention and it just expanded upon itself. And maybe that's just the nature of the people you're attracting or just, I'd like to think the nature of our industry more so now is like we all are trying to, come together in a sense and offer, you know, our different talents. What do we have to contribute? What do we know? What have we learned? How can we better, you know, serve each other so that we can, you know, take what each other knows and use it to grow and to not make the same mistakes or to, you know, decide how we want to proceed forward. And that's just one thing I really admire about your podcast is it is, like I said before, it's just so helpful and it's from so many different points of view that it's very interesting to see the perspective and hear different perspectives and it's it's just very eye-opening as well because you know a couple of things that some of your guests have said I'm like oh I've never even really thought of that and it can be something simple or something profound but it's like it, it is a binge-worthy podcast I've definitely listened to <laughs> quite a few but I just, yeah, it's just, I'm all about knowledge, as I said before, and any knowledge that I can take, that I can pass on, that I can give, it's like very commendable. So very glad that you did start it. And thank you to that mentor. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Th and thanks for all the kind words. It really means a lot. So tell me and listeners something about you that 
hardly anyone or no one really knows about you. Yeah. Well, because it's mostly music related or directly affects that, I am actually deaf in one ear. So I actually only hear out of my left ear and my right ear has about, well, technically it's like 10% hearing, but more or less not a lot going on on that side. So as you can imagine, that kind of directly affects how I hear, how I, you know, everything music related, everything just you know, in life. I don't really know any different because I was born that way. So I don't really know what it would be like to have full hearing or how different it would be. But even as a musician, like I can't really wear in-ears. I can, but it's interesting for me because, you know, it's I already only have the one ear <laughs> to hear out of. So it it just throws things off. I have to really think about it. It's it, It's interesting when we're mixing things or like it's just, yeah, it's something that I deal with. Not a big deal, but interesting fact. And I don't usually tell anybody unless it comes up for some reason. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That's so interesting. And it seems like it could be something that could really hinder someone in, you know, the profession of singing, but clearly it has not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know how they always like, you see like artists, sometimes they'll plug one ear and be like, do the whole Mariah Carey run thing. Yeah, I'm like, I just don't have to do that. It just like plugged <laughs> it for me. That's great. I can always hear myself. So maybe that's why I tend to be like on pitch more often than not. Yeah. Fia, thanks for sharing that. And thanks for <laughs> yeah. sharing your time. And thank you for helping me test this um, Lips and Connect software. I'm glad it sounds good. And I'm hoping to switch to it soon. So yeah. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Easy. And yeah, it sounds really good on this end too.